Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Russell Spatz. I'm an alcoholic. It's like an oil painting out there. I'm a member of the Carl Gables Group, but I haven't found necessary to have a drink since January 25th, 1981. And uh, I don't know about the sex day of sobriety thing. You know, I, I had a, a guy who was married to one of my kinfolk. He once said, you know, before I met Russell, before I met your cousin, he says, your cousin, your cousin, Russell, made me a millionaire. I said, really? He says, absolutely. She made me a millionaire. I said, that's incredible. That's incredible, John. He says, yeah, because before I met her, I was a multimillionaire. <laughs> They're divorced now. <laughs> so, anyways, it's good to be here. So I'm going to talk about some crap that you haven't heard before. And uh, and uh, we'll make believe this an AME. It's not going to be like any other AME you've ever been to. I've been to thousands of them. And this is going to be a little bit. I, I aim to please. On a, you know, my, my first sponsor, I asked him, I said, you ever get resentments? He says, get them, I give them. You know, so. I don't mean to be obnoxious. It's just, it just comes natural, I suppose. <laughs> Tell you a little bit about my son. Now, look, I've been sober. It'll be almost 34 years. Not a record around the year. He's got 40. And uh, my sponsor's got like 57 or something. And uh, I'm going to try to speak to you. What I try to do is I don't do a lot of planning on this stuff. I'm going to try to speak. There is something specific I want to talk to you about tonight. And I want to talk to you about the double-minded life. And that's from the book of James, which is one of the major books that this whole thing is based upon. And uh, I'm not going to talk a lot about drinking. I'm not going to talk about drinking at all. Because drinking really has not. You're in here now because drinking is not really something that you need to be interested in. Because that's you're, you're done with that. Or you're not. But I have no power over that deal. That's, that's your deal. I've been to AA meetings all over the world. Thousands of AA meetings. Nobody's drinking. This isn't a program for people who are drinkers. This is a program for people who are sober. You know, I, 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 I'll tell you how. I, I, I only know one way to get to AA and to stop drinking is you got to drink. I don't know how to do it either way. you got to drink, you know. And I, I'm a firm believer you don't rob an alcoholic of his last drink. You never rob an alcoholic of his desperation. Uh, we have groups of people that are going to meetings and sucking their thumb. They're calling Al-Anon. They're all out there. They're wonderful. My wife is the queen. The ladies of perpetual revenge. She's out there. They're all trying to stop us from drinking. They're dry. They're going nuts. You know what I mean? They're trying to do that deal. And uh, John, you know what it says in the book? It says we don't argue with the alcohol. We don't argue with the alcohol. This is John Barleycorn, you know, is our best, really is our best advocate. I don't necessarily think alcohol is a bad thing. It's a good thing. I mean, you know, this this place would be pretty wild and crazy if it wasn't for alcohol. You know, we, we do have an AA police force. It's called Booze. If it wasn't for Booze, you'd be, there'd be fist fights all over this place. But Booze is sort of like our, you know, we're like a self-cleaning oven around here. Every two years, the Booze comes through and takes out the stuff, the people that aren't doing this thing right. Sort of keeps on purifying the deal. That kind of deal. And, and it's important, I think, the one thing I had going for me, one of the greatest things I had going for me is, uh, more than anything else, I didn't want to drink. I hit my bottom, apparently, up until now, and I didn't want to drink. Because when you come in here over a period of time, you're asked to ultimately do crap that no thinking, living alcoholic would ever think of doing. Ever think of doing. I mean, it's one thing when you talk about stop drinking, but stop with the sex, and stop with the womanizing, or, or the flirting, or stop with the buying, and stop with the spending, and stop with the... The lusting and stop with the envy and stop with the greed and stop with the whole, stop basically stop with your lifestyle. And, uh, the kind of stuff that you're ultimately asked to surrender in here when you surrender your will and your life over to God, the stuff that you're asked to lay down and sacrifice, it's just so tremendous. Stuff that really no thinking human being is designed to do because we're designed to grab, run, selfishly have and take in order to get ahead. And God knows the world out there. It's not me preaching this stuff. You know, all you have to do is walk out there and look at the billboards and look at the cars and look at the movies and look at the TV 
It's all about the Viagra. It's all about the sex. It's all about the boob jobs. It's all about it's all it's all about the money, the property, the things, the running after the crap. You know all the stuff they're talking about. The discussion needs that they don't have or they might lose. The things that keep you up at night, just worrying about that stuff. And so you're not going to get any relief out there. They're the cheerleaders for the way of life that's killing us. All you have to do is look in the in the sixth step where they talk about they talk about you know the separation between the men and the boys. And they talk about the difference between the men and the boys, the separation that actually happens in Alcoholics Anonymous, is the man is that one who wants to repeatedly improve himself and grow in the image and likeness of his creator. And then they talk about the problem we have. He says, we don't want to deprecate material values. We don't want to deprecate material things, but nobody's made a worse deal of running after money, power, and romance. That's right, romance. Now I'm talking Lifetime Channel shit, you know? Running after that crap than alcoholics. You know, and you know, most people come in here because it's not, you may come in here, you, you either want what we have or you want back what you had. Some people come in here and what they really want is they want back what they had. They want to get sober so they can get back to where they were, looking for the things that they once had, you know, and that sort of thing doesn't work. Somebody just told me Robin Williams died, committed suicide, had 20 years, he slept in. And we know a lot of actors, Phil Seymour Hoffman, you know, all, you know, I mean, the, the, the uh, I mean, to pick on any one person, but the point is, you know, these are public figures that, uh, you know, the newspapers are replete with people who are alcoholics and drug addicts. Who's this guy who's a fantastic actor? You know, uh, the guy who played the Joker, died young, you know, with a needle in his arm. Replete with people in this world that have money, have fame, have everything you know would make you okay that couldn't stand life because they're alcoholics. They may have died because of alcohol or booze or drugs, but they really died because of something called alcoholism, which is really something that's more prevalent when you're sober. It has to do with the inability to live life, no matter what the circumstances, what's going on. Dr. Carl Manager in 1930 said, uh, in, in the book Man Against Himself, said, I've all some men and women who are out to destroy themselves. Because they hate themselves, you know. You know, you can tell what you think about yourself. You know when those moments you're driving in the car and all of a sudden a voice tells you you're a piece of shit, you don't deserve to live, and why'd you say that, and why'd you do that? All those crappy voices you have that you turn around and say, who's telling you you're a piece of crap? Who's accusing you? And there ain't nobody in the car but you. That's you telling you what you think about yourself. What do you think? When you, when you, and so you do anything. I don't know. You text, you watch TV, you have sex. Do whatever you have to do to make believe those voices aren't there to divert yourself from thinking about thinking crappy thoughts about yourself and other people. It may work for a while, but eventually it all comes down to being lonely and keep thinking that you're a piece of shit and never, it's never going to be okay. And that's the real disease around here. I mean, you can stop the drinking, but how are you going to stop the thinking? How are you going to stop that deal? So that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about being rocking in the fourth dimension of existence and experience much of heaven. You know, there's, there's so many things. It's like what the Apostle Paul said, I've learned to be content in all things. In this world, you will have problems with being good cheer. I've overcome the world. How do you overcome the world? How do you overcome the stuff that's going to happen to you, whether you're drunk or sober? People are going to die. Hey, you may get rid of the drinking stuff, you know. You know, they don't arrest you for driving while lusting or driving while feeling sorry for yourself or, you know. You know, driving by feet while being filled with self pity. They don't arrest you, but you, you can lose your job over feeling sorry for yourself. You can, you, you can lose relationships and marriages over pride, ego, and things like that. I mean, ultimately, ultimately, you can really live a pretty miserable life. You know, live a life of quiet desperation. You know. And so, what I want to talk about is really uh, emotional sobriety. Bill Wilson, these are these little talks I have now. I'm doing a lot of step series. I do a lot of step series. I'm going to be doing that one tomorrow night at the 12 step room and then on Wednesday at the, uh, at West Dixie. And I'm, I'm sort of like, uh, uh, I think what I'm going to do is probably just be doing, uh, emotional sobriety series because I end up just talking about the same stuff over and over again. So that means, like they say in chapter agnostics, I'm going to talk a lot about God and focus on that because that's where, that's what it's all about. That's what the real deal is. And so that's what I'm going to talk about. I was uh, in a, um, when I was about three months sober, you, know, you, you ever heard the term thinking outside the box? You got to think outside the box. I was, uh, I was of a mind, 
Anybody ever see? I wish I'm going to get myself that poster of the man on the bed. You know, because I sort of feel obligated somehow, some way at an A meeting to sort of indicate to people that I actually used to have a drinking problem. Even though drinking is about a symptom of disease, you know? And, 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 you know, I, I, there's, has any, does anybody not know what the, the, the man on the bed is? Uh, you've never seen the man on the bed post? Well, I'll have to bring it here just for you. I'm going to get one of those suckers blown up. And what it is, is it's a, it's a portrait of Dr. Bob and Bill Wilson sitting down in Towns Hospital while there's a guy, a skinny old guy, obviously that's not me, in the bed. Well, who it is, is a guy named Bill Dotson. He's Alcoholics Anonymous number three. And it's a rendition of them doing the 12-step with him. And Bill Wilson has the Bible open, but because between 1935, A started in 1935. The big book was written in 1939. 1935 A starts, big book, written in 1939. That's four years, right, Audrey? Four years, okay. So, I want to check with Audrey, she's got 40 years, I could be wrong on this, okay? It's four years, and then they write this book after four years of sobriety. This is what they say in the book. They say, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. That's so why it's read after every meeting. They, re they read what they said in 1939. In 1939, they say, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. In other words, you do what we did, you'll get what we got. And what they got, there's a lot of things. They got rocketed in the fourth dimension of existence, which they had not even dreamed, which I think is more than just not drinking. I've done the not drinking thing before. That doesn't necessarily rocket you in the fourth dimension. Listen, I know guys that are 15 years sober who I sponsor. I say, how you doing? They say, hanging in there. I'm hanging, you know. I don't think they're rocketed. They're not rocketed. They're hanging, you know. Most people are sort of hanging, you know. They say you'll experience much of heaven, you'll be rocking in the fourth dimension of existence, which you would not even dream. They say when we sincerely take this position, the position of trusting in God, he says remarkable, all sorts of remarkable things happen. Remarkable things. Being all powerful, he gives us everything we need. If we stay close to him and perform his work well, we lose concern about our little plans and designs. We start being concerned with other people. As power flows in, we lose fear of today, tomorrow, and the hereafter. We were reborn. I think that's why they're just not drinking. What do you think? It says we have a new freedom, a new happiness. You know what I mean? You lose fear of people, economic insecurity. He says, see to it, your relationship with him is right, and great events will come to pass for you and have those others. That's more than just being a 16-year sober, thumb-sucking dry baby, isn't it? All pissed off and worried and thinking about yourself all the time, that kind of deal. <laughs> So uh, I, uh, when I was about, so, so you heard this term, thinking outside the box. There was a time in my life where I couldn't envision life without drinking. You know? Anybody ever, ever, anybody ever have a time in their life where they couldn't envision life without drinking? Because you're alcoholic. That's what you think. That's part of the obsession. You, can't, you know, we can't imagine. You know, as a matter of fact, you finally get to the point where you can't imagine drinking anymore. But you can't imagine not drinking. I mean, that's a tough place to be. That's like the jumping off place. You can't stop drinking, but you can't imagine drinking. You can't, you can't imagine going on, but you can't imagine stopping. I mean, that's a bad deal. That's actually a good place to be. That's, it seems like a bad, like most things in AA, sometimes the things that seem bad are actually good. Finally getting to that point where you can't go on, that jumping off place is probably a good thing, although it probably doesn't feel so good at the time. But it's the greatest thing that ever happened to me. And I got to that point on December 25th, 1980. I got down on my knees and my life was over. I was the man on the bed. I was that, that's why, because I was that guy. I was that guy on the bed, slouched, listening to two guys reading the Bible to me. I was that guy. I had nothing. I had nobody. I had lost everything. I had lost my soul. I died, you know. I was, I was completely helpless and hopeless. I could not stop drinking. I was drinking against my will. Couldn't stop drinking. I was that guy. I turned on TV. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. There was some preacher on TV. I got down on my knees and gave my life to Jesus, which ain't a big deal, except I'm a Jewish kid from New York. But, uh, but you'd be surprised as to what you'll do when you're desperate. You'll be amazed. You know, isn't there a line that says, it says, you'll look. It says contempt prior to investment. There's one thing that guarantees that you'll stay in everlasting ignorance. It's contempt prior to investigation. You'll be surprised how fear of death will get rid of that contempt. How you'll investigate most anything if you think you're going to die. 
And you know, when you're a smart ass like me and you think you know everything, I did know everything, by the way, but really that's all I knew. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and when I knew everything, I was the drunkest guy in the room. So, you know, I had to get to the point where I was ready to know nothing, where I knew nothing. And, you know, for the last 20, for the first 20 years in Outbox and Honest, I had to unlearn most of the stuff I thought I knew. That must have something to have to do with getting rid of old ideas, and those old ideas are the stuff I have and the things I feel when I'm sober. Dr. Young, when he was talking to Roland Hazard, he started rolling and said, well, is there any solution? He says, not for a guy like you. He says, I've never been able to work like that. You have the mind of a chronic alcohol? He says, there's no hope. He says, here and there once in a while. Thing, people like you, that's, he, says, he says, they were like phenomena, they're miracles. I can't explain it. He says, and this is what he says. He says, it says, attitudes, emotions, emotions, attitudes, and ideas that are the driving force of these men's lives. The driving force of these men's lives are shifted to one side and they become dominated by a whole new set of ideas, emotions, attitudes. They become new creations. They become like new people. They become like different personalities. You can see that happening slowly in AA sometimes as that inspirational thinking takes over. The inspirational thinking they talk about in the 11th in, in step where they say we have inspirational thinking. It seems kind of weird at first. You know, but soon it becomes a working part of the mind. We become to rely upon it. It's not the kind of thing we have at 3 o'clock in the morning where we're trying to figure out where we're going to get the money or what's going to happen with this or what's going to happen with that or what's going to happen with that. It's not that kind of thinking that ties you up in knots. It's thinking that seems to come from nowhere. It doesn't even come from us, and it's like perfect. It's inspirational. It's God's Spirit working in your life. You'll hear it sometimes at may me. It'll happen to you. It happens to a lot of people where all of a sudden something happens in your life. You're focused on this program, you know, you're as confused as ever, and all of a sudden something happens. Your mother, your father, your brother, your cousin, your boss says something, does something, and out of nowhere you say the perfect thing. I mean, you say the perfect thing. You do, you do the perfect thing, or you don't say the perfect thing, but whatever you do is perfect. Maybe your mother says something that used to drive you off the wall, and all of a sudden you look at her and you say the perfect thing. You know, your boss says something that usually you would say, I'm fired, and, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm fired, and you say the perfect thing. Somebody does something, you say the perfect thing. And you go to an A room, this is what you say, you can't wait to tell about it. You say, you wouldn't believe what happened to me today. This happened, that happened, this happened, that happened, and I just did this. And you tell them. And this is what you say after you say, and that's not me. Because you don't understand, that's not me. You're like, you are amazed before you're halfway done because it's not you. It's like somebody else took over your body because you just said something that did something where you would all, I've been alive for 40 years and I would go crazy and I would yell and I would scream or I would drink and all of a sudden I said this, like a piece came upon me and I knew exactly what the sand did. I didn't even think about it. It just came out of my mouth. I don't even know where the thought came from. And that's inspirational thinking. And it's so amazing and it's so out of nowhere, you can't even, hey, you can't even cre take credit for it. As a matter of fact, you don't take credit for it. You say, it's not me. It's somebody else. It's like somebody took over my body. The kind of thing, man, if it could only happen. Now imagine if that thing happened maybe once. If that happened once a day, that would be amazing. How about once an hour? That'd be pretty amazing. How about if it happened all the time? If it came, what if it did become a working part of the mind? You'd probably be able to talk at meetings without even knowing who knows what you'd be able to do, you know, if you got involved in this racial thing. And where does that come from? It comes from God. So what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about what I've learned over the last 33 years. You know, they say when a man with experience gets a man with money, the man with experience will walk away with the money, and the man with the money will walk away with an experience. And I may not know much, I may not be that bright, but I've had experience over the last 30 years dealing with a lot of stuff. So I'm sitting there, so I'm sitting there one day, and I can't envision life without drinking. I can't, you know, I, I'm an attorney. I have people come to my office. And, and what happens is, your whole idea about things can change as soon as you learn things that you've never known before. You know, for instance, I'm, I'm sitting inside a box. I'm inside a box. You know what's inside the box with me? Everything I know. Everything I know on the planet is inside that box. You know what's outside the box? Everything I don't know. Now listen, let me tell you the deal. There's a lot more outside the box than inside the box, although I don't realize that. Now inside my little box when I was 30 years old, 
I couldn't envision life without drinking. I could not envision life without drinking. One day, the book Alcoholics Anonymous came crashing through that box. The next day, I couldn't envision drinking again. Go figure. I went for a guy who couldn't stop drinking and couldn't envision life without drinking. And one day, all of a sudden, this book comes crashing through that box. And I mean crashing through the box. You know? And all of a sudden, my box got a lot bigger. And all of a sudden, I couldn't envision, I couldn't envision drinking again. It's like a guy comes to my office, my law office, and he tells me the story. And he's, I said, well, what happened? He says, A, B, C, and D. And I said, A, B, C, and D. He says, A, B, C, and D. I said, well, if A, B, C, and D will happen, then that means Q is going to happen to you. And he says, well, wait a second. There's something I didn't tell. He says, what's that? He says, well, I didn't tell you about the, I didn't tell you about the chicken. I said, the chicken? He says, yeah, the chicken died. I said, the chicken died? He says, yeah, the chicken died. Well, that changes the whole thing. The chicken died. That means Q couldn't possibly happen. It's going to be Q. It's going to be R. You know, in other words, a little piece of information can change the whole deal. The information I didn't have. So some guy looked me in the eye and said, you never have to drink anymore if you don't want to, Russ. And you never have to feel this way. I didn't know that. I had a lot of people telling me that I, I can't drink or I better stop drinking or I'm going to die. I had never had anybody told me I don't have to drink anymore if I don't want to. I thought I had to drink. Just a little bit of information. And all of a sudden the box gets bigger and all of a sudden my whole attitude changes and all of a sudden I don't have to drink. When I was 15 years sober, but you want to know something? Then you come to Dot Box and Honest and you stop the drinking. And what you ultimately learn after you come to Dot Box and Honest, and you've been here a few months and a few years, is that drinking is really just the symptom of the disease. I mean, I hope all I'm saying is scriptural. And that when I say scriptural, I mean I hope it matches up and it's consistent with this book. What is this all about? Alcoholics Anonymous, and they have you carrying this thing around? I mean, what's that? I mean, who? What were they thinking, you know? It's like a clown book, you know? So, I mean, you know, you come into Alcoholics Anonymous, and, you know, you realize, and it says in the book, it says alcohol is just a symptom disease. Alcoholics drink, it's, a, it's symptomatic of being an alcoholic that you drink because alcohol was the per No woman, no, no, no suit of clothes. No amount of money, no geographical cure, no amount of sex for me ever worked quite as well as just a few drinks. That's why I drank it, because alcohol was the medicine that worked the best for me. And it doesn't mean, and this is the truth, that the other stuff didn't work. Of course, the problem is, is the other stuff does work. Bill Wilson said, he says the next frontier is something called emotional sobriety. And he said the real problem with alcoholics is not the drinking. The drinking becomes the problem. Your life becomes a bottle. And when you drink too much, strange things happen to you like they arrest you for DUI. But the bottom line is, is I drank because I could not stand living sober. Like they say in the book, I'm restless, I'm dear, irritable, I'm discontented. Unless I can again experience a sense of easy comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks. That's why I drank. I drank because I needed to drink, because I'm a nothing. I'm always going to be a nothing, no matter what kind of suit of clothes I have. No matter, it doesn't matter. I could be president of the United States. I could be a doctor. I could be a lawyer. I'm always going to be a nothing. I used to put something in my body for a few seconds to turn me into an almost, when you're a nothing, almost the stop of the world. It did something for me that no thing on the planet could do for me. You know, I went from a guy who used to say, I don't give a crap what people think about me, and all I did was think what people thought about me. All my, my whole life was about, what will they think about me? Why did I do that? What are they thinking about me? Along with that other strange alcohol paranoia where you actually think people care and are thinking about that. You know what I mean? And, and the bottom line is I used to drink this crap. You know what this crap does. You drink this stuff, and you really don't give a shit. You really don't give a shit what other people think about you. When you live a life where your whole life is thinking about yourself and thinking about what other people think about you, and you don't even know what it's like not to feel that way because you've always felt that way, and you don't even know you feel that way because you've never felt anything but that way. It's just the way you feel. And all of a sudden, you throw something in your body, and for a nanosecond, an immediate, you got an immediate reaction where you all of a sudden don't care what anybody thinks about you. Man, give me that drug. Give me that drug. Give me, you, boy, you know what would be great? You know what would be great? It would be great not to worry about what other people think about you. You know what I mean? So, I wonder what that would feel like. That you'd be able to talk fast. In front, of large, in, front of large, in front of large groups. 
I guess if you're worried about what other people thought about, you'd say things like, oh, I'm not ready. Or you just sit in the back and judge people who are talking or something. I don't know what you do. It's a strange deal. When I was 15 years sober, and I was still, and so I come into Outbox Anonymous, and you know, you start realizing that, uh, now listen, one of the things I realized, since now I know what alcoholism looks like, and we talked about this last week, you learn what alcoholism really is by being in groups of Outbox Anonymous. Because then you watch people talking and how they talk about themselves and how they talk about their problems sober. When I say sober, I don't mean, you know, I don't mean uh, 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 emotionally sober. You see how alcoholics act and talk and how they feel, these emotions and attitudes, without the booze. And you start noticing the craziness. You know, what, what, I, and what Bill Wilson said when he talked about the next frontier, he says our real problem is, is unhealthy dependencies. I guess that could be an unhealthy dependency on something that's healthy, or 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 it could be you know, or or it could be a a dependency on something that's unhealthy, but it's unhealthy dependencies. It's an unhealthy dependency on a job to fix us, or on a woman to fix us, or on a man to fix us, or an amount or amount of money in our bank account to fix us, or a car to fix us, or an unhealthy dependency on something else outside. Listen. If people really, I'm going to tell you, now this, ladies, don't blame me for this. I'm just going to tell you the truth. If we were really doing this stuff, there'd be no Macy's. There'd be no Bloomingdale's. All the shopping centers would be going out of business. You wouldn't have to dye your hair. You wouldn't have to get breast implants. And the guys wouldn't be popping back. And it'd be a whole different world. Does no one be worried about what they look like, you know, except, I mean, you, you want to, you know, be, uh, what do you call that, Not, uh, you know, proper, you know, bathe and everything, but nobody would be running out, buying this, or grabbing that, or having to have this, or getting this, or running around, spending money they didn't have on things they don't need to impress people they didn't like, because they wouldn't be running around buying half the crap you buy and doing half the stuff you do to make yourself feel like you're actually worthwhile and justified to live on the planet Earth because you'd be okay with yourself the way you are. But you know, when you're not that way, you gotta get a new car every month or every year, you gotta you gotta lose weight, you gotta do this, you gotta do that, you gotta do a million it's it's tough trying to be acceptable, isn't it? It's a tough deal, isn't it? When you're worried about whether or not you don't belong and all that sort of stuff. And that's just as much alcoholism. I mean, you hear, you, now if somebody tries to confront you with you and tell you, they say, go to hell. But what happens is you'll be in here and somebody will talk in an A meeting and somebody will say something and say, man, that guy is crazy. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, that's the way, that's what I was thinking last week. You know what I mean? Or your sponsor will talk to you. Somehow over a period of years, under pressure, we learn about ourselves and other people and we get to see what alcoholism really looks like. That it looks like pour me, pour me, drink, pour me a drink. It looks like worrying about yourself and thinking about you. It looks like anxiety. It looks about coming to comparing your insides with other people's outsides. Always comparing, always looking, always worrying, always in fear. You get to see what it really looks like. And then it gets really, because if you think it's hard getting rid of the booze, hard getting rid of the drinking, it's almost impossible to get rid of the thinking. Even when you find the first step of getting out of jail is knowing you're in jail in the first place. Even when you start realizing some of the crazy thoughts and the sick attitudes. You know, and I don't know their crazy thoughts and sick attitudes. You know what I know? I just know it's me. My sponsor said, why do you say the things you say? Why do you do the things you do? Why do you think the way you think? Why do you act the way you act? Why do you blame other people? Why are you always, why are you always, and I'd say to him, why do you get angry like that? Why do you say that? I said, and I'd say to him, this is what I'd say, I'd say, that's just my personality. I believe, that's my person, that's the, that's just me. That's the way I am. That's what I said about my first wife when I left her. I left her, I said, she was trying to change me. You know, this is me. This is the way I am. This is my personality. And my sponsor says, Russ, it's your personality that's killing you. But what do you do when people say you gotta get rid of your personality? I don't, I don't, I don't have like a spare one. You know, I don't have one in the closet. I don't even know what I'd be without my personality. I'd be, what would I look like without my personality? What would I be without me? And you know, that's the problem. I'm an alcoholic. You know what that means? That means I am, you know what it says in the big book? Here's what it says in the chat. Let me see. I don't know if you guys seen this thing before. Here's what it says. It says in the forward of the first edition, it says, uh, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings here. Anybody here sensitive? <laughs> I said to my sponsor, I said, I'm sensitive. He says, no, Russ. He says, great artists are sensitive. You're just touchy. 
That's when I wrote in my office, I said, these are all my degrees. They're all on the wall. He says, he says, these are all my degrees. He said, Russell, you know, rectal thermometers have degrees. You know what they do with those. So, so this is what it says on page Roman numeral 7 in our big book of Alcoholics Anonymous in the 41st edition. How many people here are alcoholics? Okay, you're going to like this because this applies to you and me. You ready? Page 7. Many do not comprehend that the alcoholic is a very sick person. <laughs> I don't know. I think they're serious. We're sick. And I'm telling you something. They ain't talking about the booze. I've been hanging around you all. I know what they're talking about. It's a sad deal. We're, we're not doing too well. You know, we got a lot, you know. And so the bottom line is, is, is you start coming in here and you start realizing over a period of time, you know, I'll tell you, I'm nine months over. I say, now I know why I freaking drank. Now I know why I drank, you know. It's three o'clock in the morning. I, you know, drinking is out of the question, but I'll tell you, blowing my brains out seems like a real good idea, you know. Idle thoughts of suicide all the time is coming upon. I remember one time during my life for months, I'd go thinking about killing myself. Not that I was necessarily serious, I wasn't loading up a gun, but I'd be driving along, I'd think about offing myself, or thinking about dying, or thinking about blowing my brains out, or I'd be thinking about this stuff. It had me a little concerned. I had to go see a psychiatrist, and they say, psychiatrist, I told him, they said, you know, I'm a little worried, because I keep on thinking about killing myself, and blowing my brains out, and jumping off bridges, and stuff like that. He says, well, have you bought any gun? He says, no, no, he says, ah, it's just alcoholism, don't worry about it. You know? <laughs> what is that sort of stuff, you know? I mean, you know, it's just, a, just another symptom, you know? Just another symptom. You hate life, you hate yourself, everything's difficult, it's too difficult for you, you know? It's just, you just want to kill yourself. You know, you, you can't drink anymore, so death seems a better idea. That's really what drinking was for me when you think about it. You die, you drink enough. You see, I drank from the noble of getting bombed. I drank until I was unconscious. When you think about what I was doing is, is, it's like temporarily dying. It's like you die, but the next day you wake up again. You know what I mean? It's like cool, you're like resurrected, you know? But with a headache, you know, I mean, that's it, you know, it's, that's the deal. You know, it's sort of like, it's sort of like, plant, it's like, beam me up, Scotty, I'm out of this fucking place, you know, I mean, I'm gone, whack, gone, you know, I'm gone, that's what I'm all about, you know. So you come in here, and you don't know what it's like to be free, and you know, and you know what happens is, it's not that you get rid of your personality, you get rid of your person, it's who you are and what you would be without those compulsions, without those old ideas, without those negative compulsions that drive you. See, I used to think, on my own, as I'm leaving my house and leaving my job and leaving my life and, and throwing the whole thing in the basket in order to go, so because she gave me a choice, it's either my kids and my wife and my life or the booze and the bar and the broads. It's either the booze, the bar and the broads or my wife and my child and my house. And I thought about that for 30 seconds. I said, see you around, gal, I'm going to the bar. And as I was leaving, everything that was important to me and should have been important to me was in tech. And, you know, what is the profit of a man? Gain the whole world if he loses his soul. As I'm flushing my soul down the toilet and flushing my integrity down the toilet and killing that son emotionally and killing that wife emotionally and leaving them to go to the bar, to go to the broads, to go hang out because I feel so crappy just being here, right here, right now because I need something to fix me and I don't even know what it is. As I'm doing that, and as I'm doing that, I'm feeling worse and worse and worse because deep down inside of me, saying what kind of a selfish son of a bitch does that shit? You know what I mean? My conscience, as I'm doing that stuff, I'm thinking I'm free. I'm free to go to the bar. I was never free not to go to the bar. I start thinking that I have some sort of freedom. 90% of the shit I did that I thought were free decisions were decisions that were going to happen because I couldn't help myself from, I couldn't help myself from maxing out my credit cards. I couldn't help myself from saying the stuff I did. The most of the bad stuff that happened to me came out of my mouth and I did and I was like compelled to do it. I couldn't stop myself from doing it. Anybody who's been sober and worked with alcoholics and worked with, with drug addicts and alcoholics as a sponsor, knows 90% of the time you spend talking themselves out of doing absolutely crazy things and they'll actually look at you and say, you know, you're right, it is crazy, but somehow they were thinking of doing it anyway. It has nothing to do with the intellect or freedom. It has to do with a driving force to do something self-destructive and kill yourself. Not even knowing why or how you're doing it. And when you look back and somebody says, why'd you do it? They say, I don't even know why. And that's, that's you know what that is? That's alcohol. 
And we don't even know we have it because when that's the way you've been ever since you were a sperm. You know, when from day one you've always acted that way and always felt that way, you don't know any other way of acting or feeling, and it's comfortable to you almost to feel that way. It's almost like being right-handed. It's comfortable. You don't realize it's alcoholism. It's just the way you are. And so alcoholism is just the way you are, and you go out there to that world and try to explain to them. You say to your mother and your father, they say, you haven't had a drink in five years. Why do you still go to those meetings? You know, why do you go to the meetings? You're not drinking. How can you explain to them? Because I'm crazy. <laughs> how, you don't even know how to explain that to them because you don't even know how to explain it to yourself. And how are you going to escape the gravitational force of this disease? And so I go to a meeting one day and, and uh, I'm three or four months sober. When I was 15 years sober, somebody shoved the Bible. You know, that's a whole other thing. You know, they encourage church membership and Bible study in here, you know, because that's what they did in the beginning. All they did was study the Bible. That's where this thing really came from. I mean, I'm not, I don't care about your opinion. You're entitled to your own opinion. You're just not entitled to your own facts. That's the fact that, you know, that's where we're going to end up on this. So I'm going to, I'm going to just tell you something about AA and about this deal that you've never heard before. Okay, so you can look at this in a whole different light. Because most people think AA is what we're doing here right now. In the year 2014, AA has nothing to do with This is the AA of 2014. It has nothing to do with what they were doing in 1939. Trust me on that. Read Dr. Bob and the good old time. It's a whole different deal. whole different deal. It's morphed into something else. It's morphed into some sort of user-friendly, let's not hurt anybody's feelings, you know what I mean? Don't do anything or change anybody in such a way that it's actually going to make them feel bad, you know, or, or where they're going to have to stretch real hard or change too much. You know what I mean? Let's try to do this thing easy, does it, don't go psycho on it. You know what I mean? Which is fine, except there's a whole lot of people dying out there and they're not being rocked in the fourth dimension of existence. They're just picking up a dang and cutting birthday cakes and sucking their thumbs and every once in a while they die at 20 years sobriety or commit suicide. They fall off the planet and you know, they don't get what the deal is. So in any event, yeah. So in any event, yeah, they shoved, that's what happened. They shoved another book into my deal when I was 15 years sober and the box got a lot bigger. Bigger box there. So when I was three months sober, I went to this meeting, and uh, there was a guy who was here in the meeting. His name was Al Kennedy. He had about 35 years, and he was talking, and I was listening. I was like where Audrey is right here. I was staring at this guy. And these guys always amazed me. They always amazed me. You know, I used to do first degree murder cases, tried a lot of murder cases, stuff like that, you know, pretty heady stuff. And, but, you know, I could never do with these guys. These plumbers, and I couldn't do it. How do you get up in front of a group of people and just sort of like, Expose yourself to talk without a script or anything. I, I said, I can't. How do, you, how do you do that? You know, I mean, I watched this guy. He was so comfortable in his own skin. You know, and he wasn't arrogant. You know, he was confident, but he wasn't arrogant. You know, and he was, you know, kind and gentle, but he wasn't weak. And he was just trying to help other people. And I'm looking at this guy. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. I knew what the, he, I was attra- he was attractive to me. I wanted what he had. I didn't even know what he had. He had just some sort of something about himself. That he was, you know, just something, there was something about him. I just, I wish I could be like that. You know, I was, but of course, you know, I'm not, well, I'm three months sober. He's 30 years sober. I want what he has in three minutes. You know, I'm a typical alcohol. Well, I want to like that. You know, how do you do that? How do you get 30 years in three minutes? You know, because that's the way I'm used to changing myself. I'm used to walking to the jar, bar feeling sorry for myself and I slap down a couple of drinks and in five seconds, I'm on top of the world. Get out of my way. You know what I mean? And so I'm used to changing my moods immediately. Cars, with sex, with women, with buying stuff. You know, you want to change your mood, just go into Macy's and buy something. Just get a new haircut, to change your hair color. You know what I mean? Just do something. Pop a pill, smoke a joint, you know, smoke a cigarette, drink something, do something, dance, get a day, do something. I'm used to going out there and grabbing something, getting something, and throwing it on myself, and all of a sudden feeling a little better for five seconds until, you know, the next moment comes and I feel like a piece of shit again. It never sort of works. Forever. You know, there's always something missing. And so, and so what happens is, I'm sitting there and this guy is talking, and, uh, he leaves and the meeting ends, and I turn to my sponsor and I say, hey man, that guy's great, his name is Al Kennedy. And my sponsor says this, he says, you know, he's dying. I, I mean, it's like I didn't even hear what he said. It's like a non sequitur. It's like I'm saying he's great, he's saying he's dying. I don't know. I said, I said, like I didn't hear him, I said, no, I'm talking about the guy who just spoke, he's, he's really good. I, he said, yeah, he's dying. I said, what do you mean he's dying? He just didn't name me. He says, he's dying of cancer. Well, see, he has three months to live. 
No, I don't know about you, but I'm an alcoholic, you know? If I have a hangnail, that's good for five meetings, you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm used to going to meetings where guys are complaining, you know, about my mother, my sister, my aunt, my cousin. I'm used to hanging out with complainers and thumbs up and white, cry babies and talking about my life. And I mean, I'm an alcoholic, you know? I mean, I mean, you know, I can't believe I have a flat, you know? I mean, everything is like made. Oh my God, I got a flat tire. I could be sitting next to a guy who's dying of cancer. I mean, you guys can't, yeah, but look at the freaking flat, you know what I mean? It's like everything is about me and my flat tire in my life and all that sort of stuff and here's this guy he's dying and he's trying to help other people didn't even mention it all of a sudden you know it says you want what we have and we're willing to go to England to get it I wanted what that I knew my, the vision of this program what could get I mean if this guy could be dying he'd be here happy and try to help other people and I would think I mean where did, where did he get that drug and he was sober and I knew that there. I, I, I saw you know what I saw you know who that guy was he was one of the men he was one of the men. And so my idea of what it meant to be sober changed from just picking up a medallion to something else. And I wanted what that guy had. I didn't want to just hang around in order to not drink. I wanted, I wanted that guy's deal. How do you get, how do you get that deal? How do you get unafraid of sex? Unafraid of, 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 uh, of dying? How do you get that deal? Where, where things just don't bother you that much. It doesn't mean that bad things don't, I mean, bad things can happen to everybody. People get in the car accidents, people are going to die, people are going to get cancer. I've had it twice. Still have it now, you know. It doesn't matter. How do you get to the point where you can live life and feel good about yourself and good about life and it doesn't, so it doesn't face you? I mean, everything bothers you. In, uh, Dr. Bob, the good old timers, it talks about, in the last 10 minutes, I'm going to talk about what this is really about. I'm going to tell you what A is really about. I don't care if you have one day or whether you have 40 years. I'm going to tell you what this deal is really about. What the deal is really about. In 1930, uh, they wrote this book, Dr. Bob, The Good Old Times. I suggest you get a hold of it and you read it. And you read it cover to cover and then you read it again and you read it again and read it again. This is what they were doing in AA between 1935 and 1939, even a few years after that. You know, when you, that way, when you hear people say, read from the book, rarely have seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path You'll know what they were talking about. It has nothing to do with what's going on here today. I'm not putting down AA. I'm sorry if you feel that I'm putting down AA. I think AA is great. They made it into a giant funnel. I, I, I appreciate the fact that in 1939, in order to get to a meeting, you had to get down on your knees and give your life to the Lord. I understand that. I understand that they wouldn't let you in the knees unless you got down on the knees. It was none of this picking up a white chip. It was none of this, I'll give you a chip, but if you're shy, I'll put it off to the side. It was none of that stuff. It was on your knees, on the floor. You know, giving your life to God in front of 10 or 15 people, and then they allow you into the meetings, you know? Now, you may think that's a bit rough, but I'll tell you what, they didn't have a lot of arguments about God. They had the God thing nailed down from me. They had the first three steps nailed down from the beginning, you know? It was, these guys were serious, you know? Because it wasn't like the way it was today, where it's loosey-goosey, the people drink, they don't drink, they come in, let's not hurt anybody's feelings. They had found something they thought they might die, and they were serious. This was industrial strength they had. If you weren't serious about this thing and you weren't ready to do that, then you weren't ready to go to their meetings. And so they had some serious sobriety and they had some ser serious consequences about changing their attitudes because if there's anything about alcoholics, they're defiant. They're defiant. Our chief characteristic is defiance. And they broke that, they broke that deal immediately. You know, you didn't want to do it. You didn't have to go to meetings. Have a nice life. Well, people might go out and go, go people might leave. Well, right. People might leave. They might die. Yeah, people, hey, the alcoholics die all the time. We're about as common as dirt. And maybe they'll come back with a new attitude, which is often what happens in alcoholics and honest. People slip and slide and they finally come in with a new attitude. You know, I mean, that's the bottom line. But in 1935, so if you want to find out what they were doing, this is what they said in 19, in, on page 96. Bob, noting that there were no 12 steps at the time, you know, a lot of people say, if I was only sponsored by Bill Wilson or Bob Smith, I don't think so. You know, Dr. Bob, that's the guy who said, if you're an atheist and agnostic, or have some sort of other intellectual pride that keeps you from what we talk about in this book, I feel sorry for you. Your Heavenly Father will never let you down. No, I don't think so. These guys didn't fool around. They got you down on the bed by the hospital bed on your knees. I mean, they were seriously into the God thing. Dr. Bob noted that there were no 12 steps at the time and that our stories didn't amount to anything to speak of. Later said they were convinced. They were convinced that the answer to their problems was in the good book. That's the Bible. That's the Holy Bible. Now listen, to some of us older ones, that's the old timers, 
the parts that we found absolutely essential. I don't know if we have any English majors in here. You know what the word essential means? It means, you ready for this? Essential. You know what absolutely essential means? That's like really essential. <laughs> to some of us older ones, the parts that we found absolutely essential were the Sermon on the Mount, that's in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, and the book of James. We were almost called the James Club, the James Gang. They call those books absolutely essential to sobriety. Absolutely essential. How many people have studied that book? Well, I, because I, the ones that haven't, I guess you're not thoroughly following their path. Now, you do whatever you want to do. We're not allowed to do anything, but I'm just telling you, this is the facts. This is AA. This is conference approved material. By the way, there's no conference disapproved material. Okay, so here's the deal. Here's the deal. Let me read this book to you. It's a whole different deal. This is all about, you know, you can read the steps into the cows. I know a lot of people that do the steps into the cows come home, they'll never get this done. This book is not about the steps. It's about finding lot God and basing your life on God and focusing on God. See the relationship with him is right great enough to come past you and countless others. The great fact is this and nothing less. That we have great uh, spiritual experiences. That we have the absolute certainty that our creator is living in the hearts and our lives which are indeed miraculous. There is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. No woman's going to get you out of this. No man's going to get you out of this. You're not going to manage your way out of this. No car's going to get you out of it. Only God couldn't would if he was soft. Let no man say he needs his wife back or anything like that. The whole thing is about a relationship with God. Drum it in. Beat it into the mind of every alcoholic. You know, burn it into the mind of every alcoholic. He can get well as long as he trusts God and things that. It's all, your, your, your job now is to be of maximum service to God and other people. Removing the obstacles in his path. All these steps are designed to do the one thing and one thing only to get you to the 11th step where you're focusing on him and trying to improve your relationship with him so that he comes into your life, you know what I mean? And then you tell people about that. And that's the one thing nobody wants to talk about in alcoholics and others. They don't like hearing it because they're alcoholics and they don't want to change their lives because if that's true, then they have to change and they have to focus on God. And that's why chapter agnostics is the only chapter, the agnostics and the atheists, and the only thing that chapter says is this sort of thinking has to be abandoned. And it even says, if you're an alcoholic, you don't even like this chapter. You don't even like us. That happens in the next stand-up. You don't like it. It's, it's too bad. You either surrender. It's about surrender. And that's why it says on page 80, I'll show you. I'm going to read to you what this book is all about. This is what this book is all about. It's on page 80. Perhaps there is a better way. Perhaps there is a better way. We think so. For we are now on a different basis. The basis of trusting and relying upon God. We trust infinite God rather than our finite selves. We are in the world to play the role he assigns, just to the extent that we do as we think he would have us, and humbly rely on him, does he enable us to match calamity with serenity. We never apologize to anyone for depending upon our creator. We can laugh at those who think spirituality is a way of weakness, paradoxically, is a way of strength. The verdict of the ages is that faith means courage. All men of faith have courage. They trust their God. We never apologize for God. Instead, we let him demonstrate to us what he can do. We ask him to remove our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us be. At once, we commence to outgrow fear. Outgrow fear. Not have fear. Not have worry. Not be worried all the time about stuff in your life. They, read, they, wrote, they wrote that, but the book they were actually studying, the main book, the main book was the book of James. James chapter 1. But this is where Alcoholics Anonymous began, James chapter 1. Actually, I, I've got two translations of the book of James. I'm just going to read chapter 1. Very interesting. Then we'll read that chapter again. Anybody here ever have problems? You ever have any difficulties in your life? Any, any th stuff bothering you? <laughs> so when you have a problem, do you, uh, you go to A meetings and talk about it? You talk to your sponsor about it? You know, you write it down, you sort of work it through, try to figure out what they're doing? You ever say, thank you, God, for my problems? Say, ever say, thank you, God, for the cancer? Say, thank you, God, for me, me being broke? You know, the only way you can be, you can act a good purpose and be a decent human being, even when you're broke, the only way you can learn that is you got to be broke. You know, the only way you learn how to stay sober 
and act good pers- purpose and help another human being and get out of yourself even though you're alone and you don't have a significant other in your life is you got to be alone and not have a significant other in your life. You know, the only way you really are able to do the things you can do, notwithstanding the vagaries of the planet and what's going on in the world, is you got to suffer the vagaries of the planet. Or maybe you're one of these people, like most alcoholics are, like most people are, that you're going to be okay as long as everything is okay. Maybe you'll be okay. Maybe it's not your fault. You just have problems. And if you didn't have these problems, you'd be okay. You know? That's not the kind of human beings I want to have. I don't want to hang around with human beings that are going to be okay as long as they're okay. Because I got news for you. It's never going to be okay. And I've got some good news for you. It's always okay. But it'll never be okay for you. Unless you understand this deal. Because it's always okay. It's only not okay if you're worried about yourself and what other people think about you. If you're concerned, if you're so concerned is, is to be of maximum service to God, and what he thinks about you, you'll always be okay, because he always thinks you're okay. And he's the only one you have to please. But of course, if you don't believe in God, you're going to live that double-minded life where you're always going to be worried, should I do this or should I do that? You're always going to be paralyzed with fear. You're always going to be worried about what you're going to do and how you should do it and whether you're doing the right thing or whether you're doing the wrong thing. You're always going to be second-guessing yourself and second-guessing other people and trying to control the earth and trying to control planet and people and the planet and trying to figure out what's going to happen to you because you're living in that double-minded life because you know something? You don't really believe in it because you haven't developed the faith. They talk about it now, Fox Anonymous and all the major religions in the world. You haven't developed that faith because you don't have any faith in him. You don't have any faith in anybody. You sort of think you have faith in yourself, but the truth of the matter is you know it's way too powerful out there. You know, too many moving parts. So this is James chapter 1. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Isn't that alcoholics? You face a trial, you say, man, hot dog, I love this shit. You know what I mean? <laughs> hey, broke, fantastic, you know? Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. The testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If, if, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. What do they say? Half measures of us what? Nothing. Or, this is a better translation. I like this translation. This is from the Phillips translation. You'll like this one. When all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, my brothers and sisters... Don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. By the way, this is what our founders were reading. The James book, the book they found was absolutely essential. This is what Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob was reading. You want to know what they were reading? They weren't reading this book. They were reading exactly what I'm reading to you right now when they got sober for four years and they were rocking in the fourth dimension. You want to know what they were reading? What they were doing thoroughly? This is what they, what I'm reading to you now. Everything you've been reading is nothing. They were, were, they were not reading any of, they weren't reading the 12 and 12. They weren't reading the big book. They weren't reading anything you were reading. They weren't reading the 24 hour book. They weren't reading any of this stuff. The first four years, the guys about this program, this is the shit they were reading. This is what they were reading. And this is what, this is exactly what it says. And then maybe you'll see where we come, where this thing comes from. When all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, you got some trials and temptations, don't resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. Realize that they come to test your faith and to produce in you the quality of endurance. But let the process go on until that endurance is fully developed. And you will find you have become men and women of mature character with the right sort of independence. Independent from your bank account. Independent from your love life. Independent from the type of car you drive. And if in the process any of you does not know how to meet any particular problem he has, only to ask God, who gives generously to all men without making them feel foolish or guilty. And he may be quite sure that the necessary wisdom will be given him. But he must ask in sincere faith without secret doubts as to whether he really wants God's help or not. The man who trusts God 
The man who trusts God but with inward reservations is like a wave of the sea, carried forward by the wind, one moment, one moment, and driven back the next. That sort of man cannot hope to receive anything from God, and the life of a man of divided loyalty will reveal instability at every turn. That's what they were reading. That's what they were re- reading when they said, when they wrote, perhaps there is a better way. We think so. We are now on different bases of the, of the trusting and relying upon God. See where it came from? We trust infinite God rather than our finite selves. We're in the world to play the role he assigns just to the extent that we do as we think he would have us and humbly rely on him does he enable us to match calamity with serenity. All this stuff came from that. It's all about trusting in God. That's what the whole book is about. You read the book, you go to every page where they talk about God and trusting in God and getting to God. And then you go to A meetings and you see what happens when you start talking about God and people start talking about God. They start walking out of the room, they start looking at their shoes. That's why only one in 200 gets more than 20 years. That's why people are slipping and sliding. That's why people get sober and they stop drinking, they amass all sorts of money and they end up committing suicide. Because they don't get emotionally sober. You know, they don't get what's really offered in this book. It's offered. To them. So God bless you. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.